Welcome, I'm Madeline DiNono, President and CEO of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media. With me is our esteemed ASL interpreters, Ashley McHenry and Gabe Gomez. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that in Los Angeles, we are currently on the traditional lands of the Chumash peoples. I wanna recognize that we are all connected with one another and that the ground beneath my feet is historically the home of indigenous peoples. We want to thank our partners at Nielsen, at sag After Foundation, and USC Viterbi School of Engineering. I want to introduce our team who will be working backstage managing our live chat. We have Jasmine Borad, our Senior Director of Events, and Lisa Emery, our Director of Digital Media. Please feel free to post your questions along the way. So today is all about providing you perspectives on what's happening in television. And we're so excited to give you multiple points of view on research and insights, global content creation, and best practices for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So let's get started. Please welcome Gina Davis, two-time Academy Award-winning actor and founder of the Institute. Take it away, Gina. Thank you, Madeline. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our global symposium. We are really excited to have people tuning in from all over the globe, uh, Australia and Kenya and India and the UK. Welcome to everyone. Um, thank you so much to our partners, Nielsen, USC Viterbi, and the SAG After Foundation. So if the past 19 months have taught us anything, it's dramatically impacted how we connect, how we create, and how we consume media and entertainment and it has profoundly reinforced the critical importance of diversity, of equality and inclusion. The companies and creatives that have invested in developing inclusive cultures and content will prevail in the new normal, which is why we chose the theme of today's symposium, as we wanted to take a look back over the past five years to assess where we've seen progress and where we need to accelerate change. For our CJANE report, we decided to look more broadly at the world of TV. As we know, kids and families were leaning into a broader range of programming. 2021 also marks the five-year anniversary of the launch of our groundbreaking research tool called GDIQ, Gina Davis Inclusion Quotient, which was developed in partnership with Dr. Sri Narayan and his team at USC Viterbi School of Engineering. And I'm also excited for you to hear all of our great insights from our partners at Nielsen and our esteemed group of guest speakers and panelists from all over the globe. So I wanna thank you again for being members and partners of the Institute. Thank you. Back to you, Madeline. Thank you so much, Gina. And we're really, really honored uh, to have a video message from the newly appointed national president of SAG-AFTRA, the one and only, Fran Drescher. Jasmine, let's play Fran's message. Hi, this is Fran Drescher, the national president of SAG-AFTRA. And I just want to say that we at SAG-AFTRA love partnering with the Gina Davis Institute on gender in media. And now I think that it's really commendable that uh, they have started this program of representation for young people to see inclusivity, diversity, equality. As Gina says, if you can see it, you can be it. So brava to you, Gina, and to everybody at the Institute. Keep on going because this, you're on the right path. And uh, we are very proud to be partnered with you. You're wonderful. Think peace. Bye. Thanks to Fran, and we're so excited to see her vision for SAG-AFTRA. So as we mentioned, as Gina mentioned, we wanted to look back over the past five years to bring you trends and insights. And it's my privilege to bring um, on screen Dr. Nanoshka Metagard, who is our Associate VP of Research and Insights, who will present our new CJANE 2021 TV report. Take it away, Nash. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited uh, to get the opportunity to present our new uh, research study. So the title of our new report is Looking Back and Moving Forward, The State of Representation in Popular Television from 2016 to 2020. So what is the current state of representation in popular television? 
Well, for this report, we expanded from children's programming to analyze whether underrepresented groups are seen in popular television programming for all ages. And as Madeline pointed out, we are looking over the past five years. We examined prominent characters in the 10 most popular broadcast and cable scripted television shows uh, from 2016 to 2020 for all markets. So our study was really focused on trends, um, highlighting specific areas of progress, but also pinpointing where um, changes still need to be made. Um, and our findings overall suggest that most popular cable and broadcast programming is still dominated um, mostly by white male characters. Um, and we saw this especially at the lead and co-lead level. So I wanted to point out this chart. Um, so first I'm gonna talk a little bit about the prominence of female characters in popular television programming over this time. Um, we see that there's about 37 or 38% minor characters are female and 52.7% um, are, um, excuse me, uh, women for supporting. And then in 2020, we see this number jump up to uh, 52.7%. And then um, for screen and speaking time on the right side, we see, um, as you can see in 2019, there's a jump there for average speaking time. And then also in 2020, we see um, like a similar trend for um, screen time as well. So we focused on, as you know, at the Gina Davis Institute, um, we focus on six identities. So I'll run through those identities um, throughout the presentation. So the first one we looked at was race and ethnicity. Um, in 2020, we saw about 40% of supporting characters were BIPOC compared to about 32% in 2016. On average, we saw that BIPOC characters were about 15% of the co-lead um, and leading characters. Uh, there was a low of 10% in 2018, and it reached a peak of 19.6% in 2017. In 2020, we saw that BIPOC, BIPOC characters were nearly um, about half of all minor characters, and this was um, an improvement from 2016, where we saw about 38% um, BIPOC characters for minor characters. So next, we looked at... Um, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Oops, I don't know what's happening. Sorry, I think my, okay, sorry about that. For dis disabled representation, we see in 2020, 19.4% of leads, co-leads were disabled. This was up from 2016 when there were no disabled leads. So this is a, a sign of progress here. And then in 2019, there was a peak of 23.1% of leads and co-leads having a disability. Um, we see that disabled representation is um, largely steady at the supporting character role. Um, we saw a high of 6.7% in 2017 and a low of 3.4% in 2019. Um, we do notice that minor characters rarely have a visible disability, and this might be because, um, you know, a lot of characters have disabilities that might not be visible. So if there's no character arc, we're not able to pinpoint um, with a character that appears on screen just for a short period of time. For 50 plus representation, we see that in 2016, about 60% are uh, leads and co-leads, but it dropped drastically down to 7.8% in 2017. Um, but we do see an increase again after 2017 and then a drop again in 2020 to 16.1%. Um, the share of supporting characters reached a high of 26% in 2016 and a low in 2017 of 19.5 percent, but we do see a general trend um, remaining steady over the past five years. The share of 50 plus characters in minor roles was at its lowest in 2020 um, at 9.7 percent and its highest in 2016 at about uh, 34 percent. So if we look at large body type representation, we see no leading and co-leading characters uh, had a large body type um, in 2016. 
And then from 2017 to 2020, there were less than 8% of all leads and co-leads. Um, this is kind of alarming because we know in the general population, um, we see a large uh, sector of the population has large body type, um, and it's not being accurately reflected on screen. Um, large body type characters were most often shown in supporting or minor roles. Um, the share of supporting characters was between 6.7%, and we saw this in 2017, and 12.12% .12 in 2019. Um, for minor characters, that was between 5.4 and 19.1%, so you see that variation there. And then large body type representation dropped from every category of prominence uh, from 2019 to 2020. So that was also an interesting finding. So I'm actually gonna go back because I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my presentation, but I don't wanna leave out our LGBTQIA plus representation. Um, so actually there were no LGBTQIA plus leads and co-leads from 2016 to 2020. Um, and there was a decrease in supporting characters over the past five years. So we had 2.6% in 2016 and 1.3% in 2020. Um, we also see uh, a near absence of minor characters in the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, this, this kind of tells us that um, these individuals remain nearly invisible in mainstream television. And this is alarming because um, this community makes up about 5.6% uh, of the US population. So we're not really seeing that um, depicted on screen, unfortunately. So I'm gonna skip back to the intersectional analysis of gender. So we saw that female characters were less likely to be 50 plus compared to male characters. So 16% of female characters were over 50 uh, compared to 29% of male characters um, that were 50 plus. Uh, we also saw that women and girls were more likely to be BIPOC characters. Um, you see a slight increase over uh, characters that were BIPOC and male. And then 11% of male characters have large body types compared to just 6% of female characters. Again, that could maybe speak to the idea that, you know, on screen, we believe that women should not have a large body type or we don't see that representation as often. Um, characters who identified at LGBTQIA plus were equal, equally likely to be male as, as female. And then male characters are more likely to have a disability and this is compared to female characters. So you see at 6% compared to three. So why do we wanna push for inclusive content? Um, we actually, uh, I'm going to present some findings from a survey conducted by Nielsen in May, 2021. And for historically included populations, content inclusive of their identity group makes them more likely to watch. So if you're seeing yourself on screen, you're more likely to watch programming because you feel like your um, perspective is being represented, right? And then over half of AAPI, Native and Black people feel there is not enough representation of their identity group on TV. So it's the idea that these groups or BIPOC people in general don't often feel like you know, they're, they're seen and heard um, in media. And then when they did find inclusive content, more than a third of BIPOC respondents felt representation of their identity group was inaccurate. So when they did see themselves on screen, they thought the representation was not, uh, not authentic um, and um, just kind of full of stereotypes or tropes. So what do we do about all of this? So we offered some recommendations. Um, we want to emphasize the importance of um, collecting data about the status of on-screen representation in entertainment media. Um, this continues to change. So it's always necessary to track trends over time to see where we've come from, where we're going and where we're at right now. We also need to very marginalize identities depicted on screen. So, um, the inclusion of people who identify as LGBTQIA+, people with disabilities, older adults, people with large body type. Um, we need to make more content that's diverse and inclusive. And we need to look at intersectional identities because we cannot forget individuals are complex and we need to reflect that complexity on screen. 
Uh, last but not least, we need to incorporate storylines of underrepresented groups into content for general audiences. Um, so we don't want it to just be for, you know, a, let's say uh, a Latinx show for a Latinx audience. We want uh, that broader general appeal. Um, so the more we can expand the stories we tell, the more appeal it will have um, more generally. So we're going to make you know, diversity and inclusion, the norm and not the exception. That is our goal. So thank you. I'm going to uh, pass it back to Madeline. Thank you, Nosh. And just so you know, everyone, if you want to look at the full report, it is now on our website. And Lisa, if you can post a link, uh, that would be great. And so one of the things I mentioned to you is that we wanted to provide you with a global perspective. And so we've invited some of our global partners to contribute some thoughts on what's changed in kids' content. So the first uh, video we're gonna show is from Latin America. And it's from our partner, Erica Vogt, who is the Director of Programming and Acquisitions for HITN Television and Digital Services. So Jasmine, can you roll Erica's video? Hi, my name is Erica Volt Lowell. I am the Director of Programming and Acquisitions for HITN, a non for profit Spanish language television network here in the United States, and also EDI, which is our subscription video on demand um, service for preschool age children here in the US as well as Latin America. What we have seen over the last five years, and in fact, historically in LATAM and US, is the fact that there's very little. Um, volume of production for children's programming. In fact, most of the programming has been acquired either from the US or from other areas outside of the territory around the world. We have seen that the local productions for free television channels in LATAM are really kind of minimal in what are required uh, by law to have on air. We do see that pay TV channels have had uh, a really strong following and continue to do so, but really their portrayal of women on screen is um, is less than stellar. Let's say um, they are kind of historically very, very far behind um, advances made in other parts of the world. In fact, with children's programming, what typically happens is that these producers take what is on regularly scheduled program like game shows and variety shows and even telenovelas, soap operas, and they kind of adapt them for children. And again, females who are portrayed in these programs are kind of more considered set decoration and, and, and stuff to add color, not exactly to partake in the drama of what's happening on the, on, the, on, on the show. We are though seeing that with the, uh, the prevalence of on-demand uh, services, there is really more of a demand for higher quality production and series that are really doing well, that are coming out of the region and that are, are really kind of done in a way that is, that is quite um, new for, for Latin America. And what we hope is that this kind of demand for high quality content will permeate through the children's uh, production uh, section and really kind of bring about a more, a fresher perspective and, and, and a new way of, of making series and, 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 and creating content for children. Thank you, Erica. And so as I mentioned, uh, five years ago, um, we launched our first research tool uh, infused with machine learning and the GDIQ, which stands for the Gina Davis Inclusion Quotient. And we're so proud to have Dr. Sri Narayanan, who is a professor of electrical and computer engineering. And he is also the Nikki and Max Nikias chair in engineering at USC to present some new insights and developments with machine learning and for our GDIQ. Shri, take it away. Thank you so much, Madeline. Uh, I'm so honored to be here with all of you today. And I'm so delighted to share some of the work that we've been doing together as a part of this team and as part of this incredible journey. As Madeline pointed out, uh, we were looking back five years, but also you're very excited about what is next moving forward. And so, in fact, now we heard about GDIQ, many of you know about it. You know, it's a continually developing and evolving sort of tool. And underneath, as a part of this uh, uh, intellectual like powerhouse, there's lots of number of engineers, you know, such as myself and my laboratory at USC, been working on and contributing. 
In particular, we've been developing what we've been calling computational media intelligence. Basically, the idea is to shine light on media representations of people, how they're portrayed on screen, what are the perceptions and impact it has on individuals and you know, society at large. And this we try to do through a computational lens grounded in data using multimodal interdisciplinary approaches and through very collaborative partnerships between social scientists, scholars, people in the industry and the community. In particular, you know, we have a big focus on this is to support diversity, equity, and inclusion, both by creating tools for enabling awareness, such as GDIQ, but also creating tools for implementing change that people desire. So this has kind of been formalized recently as a center uh, for computational media intelligence at USC in collaboration with Dana Davis Institute and Gender and Media and with par in partnership with and uh, support from Google and the incredible researchers and colleagues there. So there are a number of pillars of this uh, center. First and foremost, research and development, such as you know, uh, contributing to the creation of tools like GDIQ, but also in the process, right, we've been uh, very fortunate to have the opportunity to train researchers, you know, students, undergraduate and doctoral students, and share the work through publications and through outreach activities, uh, in, including through K through 10. So looking back, we've, well, what have we done right, as a part of this uh, 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 using computational media intelligence? We've created novel tools for, for processing audio, video, using AI algorithms for computing GDIQ, deriving insights. We've also been looking forward to creating new capabilities like processing text information, such as from scripts to lay the foundation for spell check for bias, which you may have heard about um, in, in, you know, recently. Of course, behind this, are all, uh, there are many technical publications, peer review publications and venues, and you know, IP disclosures as well. Uh, looking back, we've also had, you know, as I said, like very proud of having trained several PhD and undergraduate researchers working in this domain together with uh, the Institute, with other colleagues, many of them who are professors and engineers and scientists in major industry. And also we've had the fortune to partner with industry and agencies such as the United Nations ITU, US Chamber of Commerce and so on. But what's even more exciting is to see what is ahead of us. Of course, starting with you know, engineering and AI research and development, what we're gonna to do today is just to sample a few examples of what has been going on. In fact, you'll hear from some of the researchers that are involved, students who've been uh, behind this, you know, in the next few minutes. Of course, as I point out, right, the interdisciplinary education and training students, the next generation is so important for us as a part of this uh, journey. And of course, also sort of encouraging people, not only engineers, but also people in other domains to consider careers in computing and using computational methodologies to gain insights of problems of importance, including of diversity, inclusion, and creating equity. So first, what we're going to uh, the examples we have chosen are sort of represent the kind of uh, diversity in the ideas that we want to gain insights about, you know, in television, in, in film, and so on. First is about professions. How are professions, you know, uh, portrayed in media? Can we get insights in a large scale? So this is the work of uh, PhD student Savi Barwa. So let's hear from him. Hello, everyone. I am Fabio Sachi Barwa a fourth year computer science PhD student at SAIL USC. As part of our collaboration with the US Chamber of Commerce Foundation, we study the representation of professions in movies and TV shows. We study media portrayal of professions because it affects our real world perception, career choices, and society's occupational distribution. We conduct this study by curating a large subtitle data set of professional mentions spanning over 133,000 movies and TV shows between 1950 to 2017. We analyze their frequency, sentiment, and employment trends over time. We find increasing frequency of non-gendered job titles over their gendered counterparts increasing frequency of female job titles, although they are still dominated by male professions, more STEM professions over manual labor jobs, and positive sentiment expressed towards therapists and detectives 
whereas doctors and lawyers are negatively mentioned. For more, please visit us at CCMI slash representation of professions. Thank you. So next uh, example, you know, in, in terms of understanding portrayal on screen, we want to know not only you know who's talking, who's not, so that you know we can understand what's happening in the foreground, but also of characters in the background. And how can we do this from video signals? So uh, the next work is uh, uh, presented by Rahul Rahul Sharma, who's a PhD student in computer science uh, at at USC. And in fact, we're also so delighted to have Peyton uh, together uh, with us in, in in the panel today. And in fact, we have chosen uh, a clip where. Uh, uh, they are featured, and you'll see that in a second. Hi, everyone. I'm Rahul Sharma. I'm a fifth year PhD student at SAIL USC. Here I present a demo of our work on localizing active speakers in media content. The following short clip is from a TV show named Andy Mac. It shows the output of a fully automatic system with detected active speakers in green bounding boxes and all of the faces in blue. The clip also shows an intermediate output of the system in form of heat maps, which signifies the active speaker regions in the visual frame. Here it goes. Tomorrow, his, but I already know. TJ hates me. I hate TJ. Who's TJ? The captain. He kept calling me little girl saying, go back to your playground. Whoa. What did you say to him? Nothing. I'm not going to trash talk the captain when I'm trying to make a team which I didn't. But he doesn't pick the players, the coach does, right? Yeah, but hey guys, mind if I sit down? My dogs are barking. That's way too speak for my feet are tired. So you must have noticed a tag at the right bottom of corner of this clip. Uh, it signifies the ambience of the scene, which is restaurant in this case. This is our ongoing effort to automatically detect ambience in video scenes. So for more details, visit the CCMI website. Thank you. Again, right, these algorithms you know, automatically process uh, who's talking, where are they, uh, you know, so it helps us understand you know, speaking characters and you know, background characters in greater detail. Of course, you know, a lot of work needs to happen in this, in this room. The next sort of example or demo is uh, the relationship between sort of music and how it is used as uh, in film and television and how it relates to portrayals of people. And this will be presented by another PhD doctoral student, Tim Greer. Hello, my name is Tim Greer and I work in Sale MICA where I conduct research on understanding the music's role in film and other media. I wanted to show a brief demonstration of a system that we developed here at Sale, which predicts the genre of a movie based on the musical cues that are used within a movie. What we're trying to do is understand how moviegoers may perceive a film based solely on the music that's used in a film. So I'll now roll a brief, brief clip from Parasite to help demonstrate this. Parasite's an award-winning winning drama and horror film, but if we only watch this one clip, we might assume differently. We hear strings playing an exquisite rendition of Handel's Rodolinda as we see a wealthy family on screen. Our genre classification system can actually learn to account for scenes that are outside of the film genre while making a well-informed prediction of how a movie would be so although this scene was classified as a romance by our system, uh, the prediction algorithm that we came up with correctly classified the Parasite movie as a drama overall. Our work was published in Plus One's journal earlier this year. So the final example, like a demonstration that we're going to uh, uh, offer you, is to get deeper insights into the portrayal of characters. Not only you know who's there, who's present in, in, in a story, but what actions are they involved in? Who is the agent? You know, what are the, their actions you know, targeted toward? And then try to understand the differences in the action due to role and identity dimensions, such as what you heard from Dr. McTaggart earlier. So this is in fact the doctoral thesis work of uh, uh, Dr. Victor Martinez. And let's hear from him about this. Hello everyone. My name is Victor Martinez, and I will be presenting some of the work that we have been doing for large-scale analysis of character actions. It is widely known that TV and film are full of unconscious stereotypes, especially surrounding gender and race. While some of these stereotypes might be addressed in the film, a majority are shown rather than told explicitly. Here we ask the question, how can we use computers to identify these stereotypes at a large scale? 
To this end, we collected a set of character actions from 900 movie scripts with over a million action descriptions. From a small human annotated sample, we trained computational models that identify the actions as well as the characters involved in it. With this, we were able to provide large scale empirical results to some of the findings that social scholars have been discussing about. For example, that male actors have more agency than their female counterparts. Furthermore, we also found significant differences in the way emotion is shown or being portrayed, with women being agents of affective actions more often than men, and with male-to-male -male shows of affection still being closer. In summary, this is just a sneak peek at the work we have been doing and how in the future it might help to highlight some of the ways these actions have been typecast based on traditional gender roles. So keep looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. So as I said, no, this is just a sampling of a few of the things that as we are uh, moving forward, uh, they're working together in, in gaining more de detailed insights about representations and portrayal and impact of media on people. Behind all this work at USC, there's an incredible set of uh, uh, students and researchers, uh, both alumni and some of them are shown here on the slide for gaining more sort of, you know, interactive sort of uh, experience with some of these projects and demonstrations, we welcome you to visit our project website here at, at USC and, you know, at, at the Institute. Again, I would like to thank our partnership with the Institute and uh, the, the partnership and support from Google. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sri. Thank you to your team. We love our partnership with you. And so now we wanted to provide more global insights on kids programming um, from two colleagues uh, representing Asia and Africa. So first we have Carlene Tan, who is the Director of Original Production and Development for Kids APAC at Warner Media, followed by Munya Aram, Founder and President Munya Aram Company. Jasmine, can you play those videos? Carlene Tan, Director of Original Productions and Development for Warner Media APAC Kids. We're such fans of the Gina Davis Institute and all the amazing work you guys do. Thank you so much for having me be part of your global symposium. I'm based in Singapore, where the Warner Media APEC office is. It's an incredibly diverse region and such an exciting time to be a creator, storyteller, or artist. In the last five years or so, we've seen a steady demand for content reflecting local worlds, characters, and cultures, particularly in the kids' content space, where diversity has always been important but now more than ever. We're working with talent on concepts that reflect sensibilities, authentic nuances, which our APAC fans can get excited about. See themselves, their neighbors and friends in cartoons, like Lamput, which is the show that I'm working on right now, season four, in fact. The talents working on the show come from all over the region, uh, India, Thailand, Singapore, and Australia. As a non-dialogue chase comedy, it has universal appeal. And in our design approach, we've been including visual references from these cultures, from the clothes we wear, the food we eat, to even festivals that we celebrate. We want kids to be able to see themselves and their world and be proud of who they are and where they come from. Also, learn that there is more than one way of thinking and being. For us, it's important to celebrate our differences, which makes us so interesting, yet recognize the similar values that connect us all as human beings. We hope our shows do that for our fans out there and make them laugh at the same time. Thank you again for the important work you guys are doing at the Institute. And it's such an honor to be part of the symposium today. Thanks. Hello, my name is Munya, Munya Aram. I'm the founder and president of Munya Aram Company, a company that is specialized in African animation. The goal is to bring these animations from the entire continent to the rest of the world. Why did I choose African animation? Because we need diversity in our content, especially towards the kids. We need to show them that all the world is beautiful because it's diverse. And moreover, I wanna show Africa as it is nowadays. We have the same issues in Africa as the kids all over the world. We can show the kids, for example, in a city like Lagos, 
having a um, smartphone, computers, playing video games, like any kids in the US and show different Africa than the cliches that we usually see with the animals and the jungles. So this is the plan of my company. So I have some contents in development. I'm looking for co-productions, partners, and um, also broadcasters, of course. So this is me, Munya Aram, Munya Aram Company. And I'm also launching a foundation that will target all the talents in Africa to help them pro improve their skills in animation and gaming. So thank you for, for everything and um, I hope I'll see you soon, bye. And so I did want to now play the um, insights from uh, our partner at Nielsen, Stacy DeArmas, who's the Senior Vice President of Inclusive Intelligence and Initiative. Lisa, can you play that video, please? My name is Stacy DeArmas, and I'm with Nielsen. First and foremost, I'm speaking to you today from Tongva ancestral land, and I want to acknowledge and extend the greatest respect and gratitude to the original stewards of this land. The theme of this year's symposium on gender and media is looking back and moving forward. And I sat with that for a moment and thought about it as I reflected on the events of the past years and beyond. And it's my hope that the past doesn't just push us forward, but that it informs how we move forward differently and with equity and responsibility and with grace. And media is a tremendous part of how we do that. And Nielsen recognizes our responsibility to lean in. Why? Because for families and kids, television is a primary engine of information gathering, ideology formation, and community connection. And as we continue to confront the challenges of COVID-19 and systemic injustice and polarizing politics, the content we consume can be a resource and a refuge, but it can also offer an escape from reality and comfort in connection. And this is particularly true for families for whom programming is a deeply connective affair. Look no further than Raya and the Last Dragon, where AAPI families paid a premium, resulting in this show being number one among AAPI in the US, even though it was third overall for all audiences. Diverse audiences want and will pay a premium for representative family content. We saw a similar theme unfold with Hispanic kids where the top 10 pieces of content consumed in December, 80% were family or kids, but the number one spot went to Selena the series. Yes, for kids viewing, because importantly for many Latino families, Selena's story is family viewing. So television and the content we choose play a really important role in helping families connect with their culture and with each other. This is also evidenced by the fact that multicultural and diverse kids and families are accessing more content than ever through platforms where there is a variety of choice and programming and, and where they can feel seen. And we see that content matters. Being seen matters. And writers and content producers and animators and publishers are all taking note. Families are diverse and different, and people want that reflected in the content they consume. And honestly, it's refreshing to see TV getting closer to modeling what our lived experiences are and the evolution of the contemporary family and content. At Nielsen, we looked at Top Kids content over the past five years and saw that so much has changed. We've seen a shift in the thematic attributes of kids content as it introduces more contemporary and inclusive topics in an informative way. But perhaps more interesting is the incredible availability and accessibility of kids and family content compared to just five years ago. And the reception is an indicator of how much families are seeking this content, well then they've spoken with their dollar. Take for example the fact that kids are 21% of the TV universe, but make up more than double the viewing population on Disney+. So it's not just that the content is available, it's that families are also willing to pay a premium for it. And still, families are seeking content through non-subscription-based avenues too, from the free tier on Peacock Kids to the incredible productions that many families, including mine, enjoys from the Jim Henson Company. But not all families are exposed equally to content. And we know that programs bring us together to celebrate and educate and in tradition, 
but for some families, television programming is a way to cope and to inform around justice and equity. As an example, during the week of the Capitol protests in January, black kids were watching more news than their white counterparts, a lot more. In fact, of the top, table, uh, top 10 cable programs most viewed by kids that week, 40% were news shows. When for white kids, it was only 10%. Rather than shielding their children from this content, black parents viewed it right alongside their kids, allowing the news to serve as a catalyst for really important family conversations. So every family views kids' content and programming differently, but it serves so many purposes. At Nielsen, we are proud to partner with GDI in the quest to uncover data and information that illuminates what is being done well, but also the gaps that still need to be closed. GDI team, Gina, Madeline, thank you so much for the opportunity to share the stage with you today. Thank you so much for your partnership with Nielsen, and I'll turn it back to you to dive deep into kids and family programming. Thank you, Stacy. Again, thanks to our partner at Nielsen. And again, uh, content is global. And I did want to also give you some point of view and insights from our partners from India. And we have two videos that we're going to play. One is from P. Ja Kumar, CEO of Tunes Media Group, and to Janini Bandari, CEO of Reliance Animation. Lisa, if you can just play those videos. Hello everyone, I'm Jay Kumar, CEO of Toons Media Group. First of all, I would like to thank Gina Davis Institute of Gender in Media for providing me this opportunity to address you all today. We live in an era where the conventional idea of gender is going through a major overhaul. Whether it is in real life or real life, we witness the constant questioning of the so-called normal ideas of gender and gender representation. The kids entertainment industry has traditionally drawn flack for reinforcing mainstream norms and conventions and also for promoting gender stereotyping. I think today we have come a long way from gender centric content, toys and merchandising for children. There is a lot of thrust today on making a conscious effort to create gender neutral products and content. Children's programming in India specifically has seen a lot of change over the years. This change is evident in all aspects, including formats, messaging and portrayal. When Toons produced our first original show, Tanali Raman, in 2003, there was just one channel, Cartoon Network. Today, we have around 13 national level kids channels and a plethora of regional channels operating in the country. The kids entertainment industry in general is booming in India. Specifically talking about the last five years, we can see some marked changes in the general approach towards programming for kids. We have also made considerable efforts to improve the gender parity off screen within our organization. When we started Toons, there were only less than 5% women artists and employees. Today, that number has risen to 20%. There is still a long way to go here, and that is true for the industry as a whole. But we are going to be there soon, thanks to the efforts of industry leaders and industry bodies that are trying to make this sector more inclusive. This is just the beginning of a new dawn, and I'm excited to be part of this revolution. Thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to, to speak to you today on behalf of Toons Media Group, and on my personal behalf, I wish all success to the Global Summit. Thank you. Hello everyone, I am Teju Nidhi from Reliance Animation. Moreover, India, if you see, uh, has a strong cultural background and geographically split into cities which are further categorized into A, B, C, D and so on. So the content that is watched across India is not the same. Kids in city B or city C or city D may not have access to digital platforms and their consumption is then restricted to TV content, which is TV animation. Uh, and uh, in India, animation is still considered as cartoon. It's not gone beyond 
uh, a particular age and if you see in india most of the content in animation has been created for ages between 6 to 12 so there is an opportunity though to create a lot of content for the preschoolers and for the youth but only time will tell about it moreover what is happening is the storytelling nowadays has been happening through the tv and not through grandparents so the content has to be created keeping this aspect in mind uh, this also means that there is a lot of opportunity in this space for us and it should start following the kids from preschoolers till youth so yes i would uh, restrict myself to this uh, thank you organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk in front of such a lovely audience thank you so much I think we're going to move forward and what I'd love to do is welcome all of our esteemed panelists. Excellent. Uh, so uh, we wanted to talk about uh, changes in, in programming, you know, in television and with me is such an esteemed group of panelists. So first I'd like to welcome Diane Ikimiyashiro, who's the Vice President of Current Series original programming, Disney Junior. Hi, Diane, good to see you again. Hi, thank you so much. Next, Sydney Clifton, who's the Senior Vice President, Animation and Mixed Media for the Jim Henson Company. Hey, Sydney. Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me. Uh, and next, Christopher Updike, who is the VP of Development at the newly minted Peacock Kids. <laughs> thank you, Madeline. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and then, uh, no introductions needed, uh, Peyton Elizabeth Lee, star of Disney Plus original series, Doogie, Kama Aloha MD, and you may recognize her from Annie Mac. Hey, Peyton. Hi, guys. <laughs> and then Charlie Cooper Henniker, director of film production at Lego. Hey, Charlie. Hi there. So great to be here. Thank you. And last but not least. Um, the Miranda May, star of Disney Channel's comedy series, Bunked. Hi, Miranda. Hi. So, um, Peyton, uh, you're the youngest, so we're going to go first with you. And I'm going to read this quote. Okay. You had said, um, I've experienced firsthand the empowerment and inspiration that is felt when you see people that look like you doing things that you want to do. So can you talk about um, your experiences and what you're bringing to your new role on Doogie Kame Aloha and what you want to accomplish? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think from the beginning, um, when I decided that acting was my dream and it was what I wanted to pursue, it was always so important to me um, being a girl and being a girl of color that I represented characters that young girls could relate to and connect with and hopefully be inspired by. Um, you know, I think I personally have um, a unique experience in watching content and looking for people that I saw that looked like me or that I felt like I related to or connected with. Um, and, you know, I think it's so important that we all have the opportunity to see ourselves reflected on screen because there is this empowerment that you feel when you see someone doing something that you want to do, because all of a sudden it becomes so much more possible. And I think it's so important that everyone has that opportunity. And so for me, you know, starting with Andy Mack, it was the this great opportunity um, for me to represent girls that look like me and also to hopefully amplify the voices of people um, that don't look anything like me, you know, that people that look like me can see and think, oh, that looks like my neighbor or my friend. And so not only are we empowering people to be proud of who they are, but also promoting this level of empathy um, 
in terms of sharing other people's stories. So Andy Mack gave me a really great opportunity to do that. And then, you know, Doogie was sort of the opportunity to continue that and hopefully, you know, add to this new wave of representation that we're seeing. Um, and so, yeah, it's been, it's been really exciting to have all these incredible opportunities to not only follow my dreams, but also hopefully um, take Hollywood to a place of, um, inclusion and representation of everyone. Excellent. Excellent. We just can't wait for the, for the new show. So um, Miranda, I'm going to move over to you. So we were talking to Peyton about opportunities and empowerment. And, you know, when we were talking on the phone, um, you said that the success of Bunk has provided you with opportunities up and beyond just being the star um, of the show, which at your ripe age of 25 is quite impressive. Can you tell us a bit about your journey and evolution into taking on other roles like writing and directing? Yeah, um, thankfully I've been able to grow uh, within the company because starting as a lead actress is like the goal, right? I started, I wanted to be an actress and that was exactly what I was able to do. But then being in that world, it kind of opens up your mind to these different roles that you're interacting with these people. And you're like, wow, I have such an interest in directing now. I've always loved leading people. And I didn't know that that would be, there was a place for that in this world that I love. And so expressing that and then having people be open to it was so great. Um, and right. I did stand up for 10 years and I wrote my own stand up. And so then going into sitcom and hearing the format of writing within that kind of unlocked this new interest for me there. And so I know that at a young age, 25, 20 years ago, I probably wouldn't have been able to be the lead actress and direct and write on a series that's, you know, as successful as this is. And so I'm thankful that you know, the world is changing as much as it is and the industry is changing as much as it is, as it is because I'm given opportunities that I'm so thankful for and I appreciate so much because I know I may not have had them before. Um, so I'm going to run with them and I'm going to, you know, appreciate them 10 times more now because I know they'll val I know how valuable they are. And I, and I love that. I love that we're in a time where I can grow and it's open. People are open to that idea. Um, whereas I feel like before there was kind of the stigma of, you know, oh, if you're an actor and you want to direct, you just want to do it for fun. And now it's, you know, no, they take it seriously. And, you know, these young people are growing and they want to open up their minds to these new opportunities. So to be given that chance is so cool. And we're so excited to see you continue, you know, on that journey. So Sydney, I'm going to go over to you. Um, you know, you're at the legendary, the iconic Jim Henson uh, company and uh, you are infusing a new vision. Um, you are infusing, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion in all that you develop. Can you talk about um, your observation, your experience, and what you're bringing to the Jim Henson Company? Sure. Um, just observation about the industry at large. It's, it is exciting to see more content that is including diverse, uh, gender diversity, cultural diversity, et cetera. Um, and of course, being at the Jim Henson Company, where sort of the, the North Star is Jim Henson as a visionary who was brave and creative and empathetic. I mean, this is the fertile ground for all these things. Um, what I would like to see um, actually is in both broadcasters and development executives and storytellers is for us to be creatively courageous. We are doing that. There are definitely more opportunities. We're seeing more content, certainly. But there have been some conversations where we see that, you know, people are in on one side of the table asking a lot of questions, sort of giving a lot of notes, seem hesitant to sort of want to, to uh, take risks where storytelling is concerned. and. That's something that I'm very proud of that we're doing at the Jim Henson Company is asking those questions, taking some risks, being brave, and keeping that North Star um, uh, first and foremost in our storytelling vetting. I think what I'm bringing to the table is um, a sense of, of uh, history, cultural history. Um, I think um, 
certainly in, in my upbringing, I, um, my mother was a poet, my father was a community activist and a uh, visual artist. So the fact that these things can intersect in a person's life on a global scale, not just a North American scale, is important to the way that we approach storytellers from all over the world, because uh, you know, the, uh, Hollywood isn't the only place where stories are told. Um, and I'm just extremely excited and proud of the questions we're asking creatively, the questions we're asking of creators, the kind of creators and storytellers that we are engaging with, and the kinds of content that we have in development. So while I'm extremely excited and encouraged by the amount of uh, content and diversity that we have seen, I know we can do better. And I see, I feel strongly that uh, we at the Henson Company are, are, are pushing the envelope in what content can look like for kids not only in North America, but all over the world. Thank you, Sydney. And so Diane, I want you to build on what um, Sydney has said. I love this create uh, creatively um, courageous um, and risk taking. And Diane, I think you certainly you know have demonstrated it because you've said we want to reflect a positive role model. It's our responsibility that we take seriously. We want to make sure that kids watching um, our shows see something or see someone they wanna be friends with. So can you talk a little bit about what you've been doing um, and also the changes that you've seen over five years just in your role? Sure, and once um, again, I'm, I'm so delighted to be a part of this panel, Madeline. And, and I also wanna thank you and congratulate everyone at the Gina Davis Institute for being such a great resource for all of us, especially in our world of children's programming. We really take all of your research to heart and, and we put it into practice. I hope you're seeing that in our content. Um, you know, while there has been quite a bit of change in the is industry overall, at Disney Junior, I'm proud to say that it hasn't really changed that much for us over the decade. And what I mean by that is that Disney Junior, we've been dedicated to producing content that embraces themes, like you mentioned, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it allows kids to have a place where they can come and see and enjoy our characters, and they can really feel and relate and aspire to be like our characters. Um, like Doc McStuffins and Mirror Royal Detective and even Spidey and his friends. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of Disney Junior. We've been the leader in this space in, in children's programming um, as the number one preschool network since its launch in 2012. And for young children, it's many times the first entry point into our world of Disney's magical storytelling. So like you mentioned, we do take this responsibility seriously. And as we work behind the scenes to ultimately bring our characters to life on the screen, all of us um, on the Disney Junior team and at Disney, we really, really um, hold true that it's important to have rep representation, diversity and um, um, behind the scenes, doing all the, the development and the producing as well as in front. So that's what our goal is and we're continuing to do that. And we're having fun with you all along the way. So Christopher, you're the new kid on the block, Pika kid. <laughs> uh, so clearly uh, this is not your first uh, rodeo. You've been in the uh, kid space for many, many years, but now in terms of your vision at Peacock Kids, can you talk to us a little bit about what are we to expect and also um, how important diversity, equity, inclusion is as you are coming right out of the gate? Yeah, thank you, Madeline. I feel really honored to be a part of this group and uh, to be at um, on this panel. Uh, you know, we are the new uh, ones on the block. Um, we are a streamer that is not yet a year old. And in fact, um, my role in creating uh, content with uh, my group is um, really nothing is yet out on, on the platform. We will have our first uh, preschool show launching uh, in December called Babble Bop. And I'm really pleased to announce that um, we all um, are really excited that the, the lead is female. It's a mixed race uh, young girl and boy. 
They have a Cuban, na Cuban neighbors that are friends and a same sex couple neighbors that have a um, Chinese son. And we're really, really excited that this will be the first thing out of the gate and continue as we develop the next thing and the next and the next are all diverse, diverse um, because we feel very, very strongly that this needs to uh, be the wave of the future. Um, as Diane said, one of the things I'm really insistent upon and is to grow the diversity behind the scenes as well. I think when writers and directors are diverse and female inclusive and so forth, and we get to a, a parity of 50%, we start to see big change happening. And luckily we um, at Peacock Original Kids get to push that right from the gate and, and use um, these last five years of, of um, much change and push it forward even further. So yeah, thank you. Well, we're really excited and we'll be tuning in. So Charlie, um, this has been a big week for us, you know, with Lego and for our audience at home, um, we've had the privilege of working with Lego. We just released a really big study, you know, on Monday, um, Lego has been on a journey to remove uh, gender bias um, from their toys, from their messaging, uh, with an eye on empowering our children. So Charlie, can you talk about how that principle and ethos is now being translated into your commercial content and on the entertainment side? Sure, and yeah, just to briefly fly in for everyone, Lego Group works on commercial content, so TV ads for kids, where we're actually showing a lot of kids. Uh, and also the longer form entertainment uh, content that all comes from fairly small concentrated in-house teams. And the beauty of that is that we get to partner with whoever we want, or it, more personally, we get to change those partnerships and dial up those partnerships and, uh, and take the work out to a much broader range of people. Um, and although our pipeline is relatively long, you know, three to six months for a commercial, because uh, of all the, the governance we have to go through and a lot longer for the TV shows. Uh, I'm really excited about what's about to start um, coming through, not only in terms of the video content, but also our product itself. Uh, and sadly, I can't share any exclusive reveals, but Christopher, you, you've already done that. So <laughs> we got one out of the session, <laughs> but uh, there will be lots to come in terms of um, better and more authentic representation in our product lines as well as in the content we use to promote it or as part of the ecosystem around those franchises. And I'm noticing in the chat that um, there's a great idea about having a universal diversity charter. I love that phrase. We do have something similar to I think what's being described, which is an inclusivity rider that we share with all our production companies. It's relatively simple and short. It's an appendix that we issue along with the contracts when we onboard a new partner, but crucially, we resend it each time we start a new project and we refer to it in the communication where we're awarding the work or we're kicking off the project. And essentially, although it is a piece of paper and it's, it's contractual to a degree, essentially we treat that as the conversation starter because the conversation is different every single time and we're learning more and more as we go. And what we found is the best partnerships we have at the moment are those who are asking us questions in return. You know, when, when we share this ambition and this drive that we have, the more successful partnerships are the ones where people are um, not pushing back on us, but coming with suggestions and ideas where we could actually collaborate to create the space for particularly for people behind the camera from a much more representative uh, set of communities than we might traditionally expect from commercial production in particular. Thank you. And Charlie, has that been well received? By our production partners, I wanna say in answer to the overall question, this time last year was perhaps more challenging than today and the year before it was treated with a degree of wariness and I think what's great about producing right now is that uh, all of our partners understand that it's not a matter of if we do this it's a matter of how we do it and how we tackle 
uh, this topic. But launching the rider in 2019, socializing it in 2020, and then going straight into a global pandemic where most of our production partners are localized to our, our base, was extremely challenging because one of the things we find, particularly in Denmark, which has a population of about 5.5 million people, is that we need to widen the talent pool and travel talent in from the UK, from Germany, from the Netherlands. And of course, that wasn't possible um, for a long time during the pandemic. So we had to take recourse in other routes and do things like street casting, working with community centers and schools, education centers, but actually the results of that were really, really surprising. And in at least two or three cases, we gave a lead role to somebody who, their feedback to us was they had never ever considered that they could be a performer or a model or someone who was depicted on camera and nor had their families or the people around them to the point where, where some people didn't quite believe that this was happening until their child was on set with them chaperoning and then they saw the end product. So we've had some quite powerful learnings along the way. Thank you, Charlie. So uh, Peyton, I'm gonna go back over to you. So building on what Charlie was saying um, in terms of impact and, and, and you inspiring you know, girls and children around the world, never thinking they could be you know, an artist like yourself, for you coming off of you know, Andy Mack and moving into um, your new role on Doogie, what were some of the big learnings or key takeaways um, that you're bringing with you uh, into the into the new show because you've had a tremendous global impact. Yeah, well, I think Andy Mack was something that was so special for me because it was obviously the first thing, or the first, you know, major thing I had done. Um, and a lot of things that I sort of knew subconsciously going into Andy Mack became very, you know, clear and conscious um it during Andy Mack and then continuing afterwards in terms of just how important it was to be having this positive impact on on young people and um inspiring young people um I spoke to so many people watching Andy Mack that were empowered by my character um and her uh ethnic background and we had the first gay character on Andy Mack and so the impact that Andy Mack had um on such a large scale became so important to me and so when that show ended it, it was very conscious um for me in terms of going forward finding the next project that was going to take that and build on that and hopefully propel that forward and amplify that more. Um, and so when I started Doogie, you know, it was, there was a very concerted effort towards that goal. Um, and, you know, the show really checked all those boxes for me. And so through developing my character and the family dynamics and how we tell certain stories and how we sort of focus on the diversity of the show in certain ways and also normalize that diversity so we can have these diverse characters without the show being about them being diverse. Um, you know, all those things that I sort of began to understand and think about through Andy Mack became um, much more focused points of, of my attention um, going into Doogie. Thank you so much for that. Um, Miranda, I want to build on what Peyton was saying about normalizing um, diversity. And this is kind of a two part for you because you've talked about the littles. Um, and how you have been quite, you know, a mentor uh, for many of the, the younger, you know, cast members. So I'd love for you to talk about your mentorship. Um, and then also you said from the get-go, the show has been extremely diverse and something that you've been um, very proud of. And it's been very, you know, organic. And I'm sure that's contributed to the success of the show. Can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, I think that 
one of the greatest parts of Bunked is that it has been diverse from the beginning. You can The cast has evolved over the years. We've changed cast members many times, but when we've done that, somebody new has come in to represent somebody else. And um, that's been great because I feel like throughout the five seasons that we have, you can look through those episodes and for the most part, somebody can find somebody, whether that be within looks or personality or story or whatever it is. The show is so diverse that I feel like that has a great impact on these kids because it's like, I can look at this show. I can possibly see somebody that reminds me of myself, but also my best friend. There's a guest star that comes in that reminds me of my grandparent. There's, you know, this show is so inclusive and it's, it brings new characters in all the time because it is camp. And I think that that has made the show as successful as it is because I don't feel like that's as common on a lot of series um, or film. And in this industry, I feel like sometimes we get put into a box and that once we're in it, it doesn't change on the series. The series is what the series is. But with Bunked, it has been this ever-changing show that I think um, has been so fun to watch because I, I don't remember a show like that growing up where I was like, oh, I wonder who's going to come into this season that's going to remind me of someone else or that's going to teach me a lesson about somebody else in their background. And I love that so much about the show. Um, and when it does come to the littles on the show, they are very diverse. They're all different. We have my specific three littles uh, that started that term were... Um, one was from Atlanta, one was from Texas, and one was from Canada. And they were so different and they all came in and they didn't have a ton of experience or anything, but they clicked with each other so well and with the ex existing cast. And um, I loved that. And then we brought in more littles and they were from different parts of the world as well. And so um, being a mentor to them has been fun, not only because some of them had never done comedy before. And so they'll kind of lean on me for how do I deliver this joke? And I give them the best advice that I can. Um, but also within the stories, the, the stories on the show with, I would say from in our fourth and fifth season, um, our stories got a little deeper and went more into background and the background of the characters. And in that fifth season that we um, just put out, um, we actually went on a road trip and we saw like Mateo's family and we learned that his mom owns a dojo. And then we went to um, Israel's uh, brother's work and we saw what he does and where he comes from and his brother's own struggles. And then we went to Lou's farm and we saw that her family kind of started to resent her for her success and leaving them. So it was like all these different pieces and backgrounds, but they all went on this journey together and it brought them closer together. And so um, I love that about the show and also the cast itself. And not only our cast, but our crew is so diverse now and has been for pretty much from the beginning. But I know that in the last couple of years, it's been a huge focus that for um, directors and writers and people coming in that we do give everybody a chance. And um, I've loved seeing that because it's most likely we're not gonna have the same director twice, which is really exciting, not only for me, but for the littles, because we learn from so many different people and their styles and their backgrounds and all of that. But yeah, it's a, it's a big honor to be on a diverse show like that. And hopefully we'll see a lot more directing coming from you. So we're really excited about that. Me too. Um, <laughs> so uh, Sydney, um, I wanna build on what we were talking about with Miranda in terms of mentorship. And we know mentorship is really important to you. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about Black Woman Animate and also the Clifton House, which I must say, we are so proud to be partnering with Sydney on the Clifton House, which uh, we'll announce to you at a later date. Uh, but can you really talk about that? Because you're really empowering the next generation of uh, youth and, and through poetry. Oh, thank you. So uh, first with the Black Women Animate Studios, I'm a senior consultant with the studio. And it's essentially exactly what it says. It's a uh, network of Black women who are um, both animate animators and storytellers. And we have a group that is actually worldwide um, working on work for hire, but also developing content. And I, I consult with the group uh, just to sort of provide some structure, but also my background. I've been in animation for over 20 years and it's been um, a wonderful journey and it's been very rewarding to be able to not only consult with the group, but to mentor young storytellers, animators, visual effects artists, writers, etc. cetera. Uh, in terms of the Clifton House, thank you for mentioning that. Um, my mother was a poet and uh, 
children's book author and National Book Award winner, Lucille Clifton. And uh, the house in which I grew up in Baltimore, um, my parents lost the house to foreclosure in 1980. In 2019, I bought it back and I decided to convert this house, which was a sanctuary for young artists and writers when I was growing up in it, into an artist retreat space and workshop space for underserved storytellers and artists in Baltimore. It's called the Clifton House. Um, and it, it's my way of, of giving back in the way that my parents both did. Um, as someone who has been in this in the animation industry, but also a storyteller, I think probably from birth, being able to be that sort of resource for, for uh, young storytellers who don't even understand, who may not even know what is possible for their lives is so crucial. And to be able to do that in um, uh, a city such as Baltimore, but also on a global scale because of uh, technology and such um, has been absolutely an honor and privilege. And it's something that respects my parents' legacy and you know, hopefully um, allows uh, artists and uh, writers to learn some things, to see themselves, to understand their, the value of their lives and to drive their own narratives also super important uh, to me. And this, this, I have to say it circles back to the vision of uh, Jim Henson as well. Um, Jim Henson wanted his, his company to be a place where dreamers come. And that's absolutely what happens here. Um, so I feel like I've come full circle as, as a storyteller, but also as a mentor, as someone who hopefully can lift people up um, as I, I move through my journey as well. I think that's sort of the, one of the responsibilities of creatives is to leave a place better than we found it and to use our creative courage and creative experience to nurture someone else's. Thank you so much, Sydney. And again, we're so excited to be partners with you. Diane, I'm gonna go back over to you. Building on uh, what we were talking about with Sydney in terms of driving narrative culture change, you know, we had the privilege of working with you on Mira Royal Detective. I think it was last year, it's kind of a blur. Um, uh, we know that I think animation was, was one of the only um, entities that wasn't super, super impacted by um, COVID. Can you talk about what's driving the narrative culture change work for you in terms of shows that you're looking to develop, material that you're looking for, the taste um, and the flavor of what we may see uh, in the next you know, few years? Mm -hmm. Well, just taking a, um, an example from Mira, the show at its core is about a, a young, very empowered female who's a, the lead detective for her, for her kingdom. And stories that have very strong um, children in the lead, especially people of color um, and, and um, young kids, girls, that, that's what sings to me and just working with our development team and, um, and, and just going deep. It starts with story and character. And it, we're, we, we all love to see and reflect what we grew up with um, in our own lives. And so we're kind of, we're, Disney is looking at us, the executives, the development and the current series and um, putting the trust in us and our backgrounds. And we, we, wanna, we wanna put on the screen what we feel is important to share with our audiences. And so um, one of the things that we do, once a show is greenlit, we work very closely with our creative teams, our artistic, um, the EPs and the art directors and the music. And we, if there is a lead, that represents a specific culture. We work very closely with cultural consultants and our also we, we also have our internal educational resource group that we rely heavily on. And we all work together. It takes a village. And we know going in that it is more work, but it's worth it to see the results of these authentically portrayed characters. But it is, it is a, it, it's a journey and there are a lot of challenges because 
for instance, with Mira, if, if some of us do not have a background in South Asian culture, then we are really trusting and relying on our consultants to give us that um, extra background and, and, um, and education in a way. And, and we we're fortunate, I'm fortunate to work with EPs and, um, and teams that really embrace what our goal is at, at Junior, at Disney Junior, which is to portray our characters in, in beautiful ways that will inspire kids, even if you're not of a certain culture, to see themselves in, 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 in um, the universality of we're all the same, even though we don't have the same upbringing. Thank you, Diane. So Christopher, I wanna build on what Diane was saying about authenticity and character development. So, you know, uh, you're the new kid on the block, and I am sure people are going to want to pitch to you like crazy. So what is it that you are looking for? What is the kind of material, the kind of shows, the kind of flavor for what we will see or how you will develop um, future content for Peacock Kids? I think we want, you know, thank you for that question. I think we, I think we want to really represent real families in America. Um, we want the diversity and inclusion to be front and center, again, both in front and behind, uh, quote the camera, if it's animation, I guess, behind as well. Um, we are looking for a multitude of things, um, both um, uh, educational content as well. I do, I, I um, work with my group, we develop um, educational content, and we also do uh, entertainment-based content. But first and foremost, we're looking for things that really have um, diversity as front and center. All, all of what is coming from us um, at, at Peacock Original Kids is going to be that in uh, the six to 12 category. Our first um, uh, uh, tween sitcom is um, called Take Note. That's in partnership with Sky, and we worked really hard um, uh, with um, that series, which is about a uh, black child from Atlanta, and he and his family. He gets on a on um, an unscripted competition singing so show, and it's about them moving to LA and his experience during that. We worked really hard with like making sure that behind the scenes was uh, very diverse, driven with directors and female representation, and um, writers that were both diverse. So that's what we're going to be looking for more of that. And we're going to be looking for partnerships. It's important to me, also as the new guy on the block, <laughs> it's important to us um, at Peacock uh, Kids um, to really focus on taking pitches from new companies. We're focused on uh, Latinx companies, uh, Black owned animation companies. This is very important to us. Um, we think that that's how we really get some authentic authenticity happening with what we're saying about that portrayal going on um, on screen. It comes from all the way down to the production company itself and, and bringing that forth. So I think it's really important there. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Charlie, um, you know, you are a board trustee for Power Pride, which is a, a charity focused on creating access uh, to LGBTQIA spaces for people with disabilities. Can you talk about how that's influenced your work at LEGO? And also, can you talk about what you're looking for in terms of uh, new content over the next few years? Sure, and uh, actually that appointment arrived at, uh, a little bit before we got the results of the Gina Davis Institute survey of our content where, um, as we were saying earlier, there's always more work to do. Uh, it was encouraging to see that in some areas where we're performing quite well, but one area we really need to look at in terms of representation on screen uh, to begin with, uh, and certainly behind the camera, is disability. We, we were not performing anywhere near as strongly as we, we hope to be or as we should be um, for our audiences. Some of the conversations I've been involved in is as part of the board trustee role have been actually very powerfully about language and how we refer to uh, everything from achievements and access 
to, of course, the wording around uh, a disability that somebody may choose to declare or not. Um, one of the one of the ways we're navigating that at the Lego Group is to build an ecosystem of different uh, conversation points and entry points for this for this discussion uh, that people are informed upon how to use. So we actually have a model at the Lego Group, which is called the Leadership Playground. Play is one of our core values, as you can imagine, and that encourages people to be brave, curious, and focused. And so what we're doing is encouraging all colleagues to, to employ those modes to speak to the teams that we have in place, which is a dedicated diversity and inclusion team. But we also have a, an internally elected DNI advisory board, which is composed of Lego colleagues who have lived experience uh, and can offer authentic pers perspectives and who want to, and who have put themselves forward to be, to be able to do that. Uh, who can offer advice on a kind of sparring collaboration level to colleagues who are perhaps new to a certain topic or new to uh, working in, a, in an area of representation. And it's crucial that we don't present that to our colleagues as a gate. You know, it is not an approval checkpoint. It is a conversation point. And it's something from which we can learn and build, again, sorry to use a Lego group, uh, friendly phrase, <laughs> build up and, and develop and create something new um, out of it. And I think the, the toughest projects in terms of the, the ongoing conversation around perhaps something like casting, which seems to never end, are also the most rewarding projects. And the teams who come back from those shoots or from those program development cycles uh, are hungry for more. They feel more confident, they feel more equipped. Uh, to, to take these conversations. In terms of the content that we're looking to see more of, uh, it is, again, without me being able to disclose anything specific, uh, it is turning out to be one of the greatest creative adventures that the LEGO Group has ever had in front of it, is to explore this space. Uh, children are our role models. That's, again, one of our brand purpose statements. And to that extent, we, we're looking to change quite radically the makeup of uh, the cast that we have in some of our best loved shows, where it turns out that you can actually add new characters. You don't have to uh, go back to the drawing board. You can just develop and bring in new dimensions, new perspectives, new characters. Uh, and in terms of the commercial side of things, what my team and I are always looking for are, of course, production companies that are owned and operated not just managed by, which is a crucial distinction, <laughs> but actually owned by uh, people um, from what we would call in the UK minority backgrounds, because then we know where we are putting the money, to put it really bluntly, but also where we are creating opportunity, because we know the talent is out there, uh, but what we need to do is create the opportunity for that talent and bring them in and co-create with them uh, whether that means, for example, investing in a more junior director who doesn't necessarily have the level of experience we would normally seek uh, for on a commercial or a long form production and get them to work with an established director, shadow that person, work on the project and get that commercial onto their portfolio and their credentials whilst being paid a fair rate. That means they are then qualified to run a commercial like that as the director the next time round. And when we work with directors from, from those backgrounds that we, you know, they're different to the, the classic uh, straight white male director profile, we do see the kids reacting in real time on set. You know, they are seeing and recognizing that there is a career path they could follow. There is something that they could do when they grow up something that maybe that hasn't been represented to them, um, whether it's through school or through family and social networks, those kids who are on set that day are seeing it happen in real life and they then believe that it could be something they do when they grow up. Well, I just wanna give great thanks to all of our panelists, um, all the research that was shared. And I know we didn't have time for Q and A today, but I think Lisa mentioned to you that if we have your email, we will follow up with our panelists. 
and we will get answers to your questions. Uh, the study that Dr. McTaggart uh, produced today is currently on our website. And we do hope you all are following us at, at GDIGM. And just wanted to say thank you so much for giving you giving us your time today. Thanks, everyone.